Well, hello. Um, my name is Julian Dirkes. This is a second attempt at a Mongolia Blab, and uh, I've got Mende Jagasahan with me today, and we're going to talk about how uh, Mongolian democracy might have developed in, under the hypothetical assumption that Uyutogoi, the very large gold and copper um, project in uh, Mongolia, if that didn't exist, what exactly would have happened? Uh, so let me first tell you real quick who I am. Uh, as I said, uh, I'm Julian Dirkus. I teach um, public policy and global affairs at the University of British Columbia uh, in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, and I have been interested in uh, Mongolia for quite some time, particularly in mining policy and democracy. And so this as a topic uh, is a is a is quite an obvious one. And I've got a great person to talk about this topic with today, and that's Mendy. So Mendy, would you just introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Mindy, and I'm a PhD candidate at the Political Science Department of the UBC. And I'm from Mongolia, and I, with a great passion, I'm quite passionate about like learning and and observing Mongolian politics. And this will be the, my first blabbing, so it'll be a good learning experience. Okay, fantastic, man. It, uh, um... Just to specify that a little bit, the idea for me behind a blab is a possibility is is it's quasi a talk show, if you will, and that's a little bit of what we're doing now. But of mm -hmm. course, potentially people could be joining us online, uh, particularly once we build a little bit more of an audience. But we're also recording this, and so that we'll be able to share it later on, and so it becomes a little bit of an equivalent of a of a podcast, if you will. So then let's right. jump into. Uh, go ahead, Mendy. Oh, no, I uh, agree with that. Okay, so thank you for telling me that. Okay, good. Uh, so let's jump into this topic. And so this is a conversation you and I had, um, I guess, about two weeks ago or so. We started, we, we just got off on this track. And so what we're thinking about and what we're trying to talk about today, just to give a little bit of an introduction, while maybe you can copy some of your information into the into the chat window there, if you like. But um, I mean, there's been a long question, particularly in Asia, about sequencing between economic change and political change. And so the big examples of this are places like South Korea that developed strongly economically before democracy really took root. Um, the obvious case, the obvious other case is China, where the argument constantly, at least from the Chinese government, justifying its authoritarianism is to say, well, look, we need economic development before that kind of democracy might might have a possibility. And so the question that that Mendy and I have asked ourselves several times and in several moments is how important for the institutionalization of democracy in Mongolia is the sequence in which it happens. And by that, um, we mean that, that uh, democracy came before economic development. Uh, and so that's that's a little bit of the question we're wanting to ask and uh, and to think about in the context of that one giant mining project, Uyutogoi, that has such an impact on Mongolian budgets and on, on Mongolian um, development, uh, whether democracy would have taken a, taken a different direction or a different trajectory uh, if that project uh, hadn't existed. And so with that setting, let me ask you, Mendy, um, what did, so if we take somewhere around 2002 as, as our moment here in this discussion for that hypothetical question of what if Uyutoga didn't exist? So what did Mongolian democracy look like in 2002? So it's a, the first of all, it's really hard to make a causal connection between OT and democracy. It's, a, it's hard, like it's OT is a trophy maybe or may not. And by the time 2002, the, the Mongolian politics was, wasn't quite interesting. So we had a, four years of the DP government, lots of infighting and assassination of Zurich. And the government was really not so successful. And, and people started like, losing the trust in, the, in democracy. And that really results in the landslide victory of the NPRP in 2000. And then with the landslide majority, NPRP started like a start like accumulating their power over all the state structure and state institutions and and even there were attempts of like a kind of like a strength in the censorship over the media and rights. So it will be so that's like a time that's like a my reflection of 
the democracy in 2002. Yes, still we have a, two strong political parties, but one is in, in dumpling the power, the other is out. And the media was still there, even though there's a censorship exists. And people didn't really like uh, lost their hope in democracy, but they still believed like a democracy will give them a chance to change the governments or parties in, in power. Okay, so that's a, that's a great way to set the table, if you, right? So the, just to summarize, right? So we have, this is 12 years after Mongolia's democratic revolution. Uh, we've he seen a couple of changes of government by 2002. Mm -hmm. And that's one of those hallmarks of a, of an institutionalized democracy to say, okay, things are on a, on a good trajectory. Uh, the constitution seems to be on a sound footing. There's participation in the political process. There's freedoms, whether that's press or party participation, the like. So things are on a good trajectory, but as you said, um, there's also some doubt um, related to particular parties' actions or so uh, and, and what that might've meant. Oh. So then, and yeah, go ahead. I would just briefly like uh, just sum up what I'm trying to say is that from a competitive election perspective, Mongolia passed the two turnover tests. So NPRP win and lo losing election 1996 and then win again in 2000. So from a competitive, competitive election perspective, yes, Mongolia passed the democracy test, but I really don't think like the Mongolia passed the test of the quality of democratic institutions. The institutions still exist there, but there are a number of challenges in the institutions. Okay, so that so that's the that's the mo moment in time when we're now imagining a different universe. Uh, where um, what actually happened didn't happen, and what actually happened was the discovery of the Oyotoga deposit um, by a Canadian mining entrepreneur and the subsequent development, and, and all that's done for the Mongolian budget and, and for everything else. And so let's assume that didn't happen, right? So 2002 is where we're starting our imagined universe. No OT. No OT. So what happens to Mongolian democracy for the rest of the 2000s? So rough, let's say roughly through the year 2010. So I, okay, okay. The, the first conclusion I would like to make is okay, there, the Mongolia is still a, a democracy at the moment. Because this is a choice made by Mongolians and it strengthened its sovereignty and people all trusted democracy is the only way to govern in Mongolia. So I don't think like if the if the OT appeared and democracy will if 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 there were no OT, the democracy will disappear. So democracy will exist there. And the oligarchic competitions will still like a uh, continue. So people, the political parties and then wealthy people, they're still like a uh, struggling or competing over the political power. So that political competition will still exist in Mongolia. And but many, will... can I can I interrupt you there for a moment? So, um, what what would you say? So when we, um, what are the powers in Mongolian politics in two thousand two? So when you talk about oligarchic or business interests, how did they have an impact on the political process in two thousand two? So by two thousand, like by the two thousand, you start like looking at the wealthy politicians are getting into the politics. So you will all start seeing all these business people I start getting into the political parties or maybe the political parties requesting them because of their funding or funding for their for fundraising purposes. And then you will see that trend coming around like in 1996, 98 and 2000, you start clearly that the wealthy business people entering into politics. So I will see that trend goes forward. Mm -hmm when if there is an OOT. And that will certainly cause the public public discontent of obviously like the, the they're not representing the, the population and then you will still see the popular politics and populists rising up and civil society opposition. So that will continue by two thousand ten. So I will still say the Mongolia will be at the stage of the competitive democracy. Okay, so that um, if Ogitoro hadn't existed, there's there's a fair bit of continuity, right? So that um, the M Mongolia might have looked similar in 2010 to the way we just described it in 2002. So, what are some areas where you think are there any areas um, where the, this trajectory of no 
large economic force would have changed things around for Mongolian democracy? So one thing, like, so like, there's not one thing I would like to just make clear that, like, I don't think the emergence of the OT will help strengthen the Mongolian democracies. I'm totally against it. This is just a one economic big project. Obviously, it brings some income. It will obviously create some brain-seeking activities, but it doesn't really affect on the Mongolian democracy, either strengthening it or weakening it. So Mongolia will still maintain the similar democratic institutions from like a, whatever like they had in 2002, we had in 2002, now like a, that will still continue in 2010. And the powerful dynamic, I would, okay, let me, let me just, back, let, let me look at, let you talk. Take it a little bit. Well, you know, the it. Do, I think it does make a difference in the sense that uh, if there had not been a, an economic engine for progress, right? And to some extent, Oyotogo has been that, right? Mm -hmm. If that hadn't existed, is there not a question about content by 2010 arising about the benefits that democracy brings to Mongolians? So what I mean is that I think people were ideologically very committed to democracy. You know, it was a, it was an internal revolution that brought it about with a lot of backing and support from the population and a lot of dedication to democratic causes. But 2010 would be 20 years into democracy. And if it hadn't, if democracy by then hadn't delivered economic well-being, better education, um, you know, better health system, a little bit higher income, all the sort of things that people might be looking for, potentially at least. Do you think there, that doubts would have started creeping in about democracy? Uh, so I'll probably disagree on a, on, a, on a certain point. So by 2002, okay, without OT, China is still growing. And China still needs like a commodities from Mongolia, and that kind of like provides some income generations for the government, and they will deal with the, with the domestic issues. So, and it, the GDP will start growing like a very late ninety, late nineties, like mid nineties in Mongolia start getting like a GDP growth. So I will see like there is a trend growing up. And that will be filled up by the Chinese economic growth and Chinese demand for the Mongolian commodity. And at the same time, you will also see that Russia's rising up, especially the oil. So when the when two Mongolia's big neighbors are economically doing well, that will probably create more opportunity for Mongolia. And that will help Mongolian economy will be still running. I mean, not a great speed but it was still running and it's not going down at the same time. And at the same point, Mongolia will probably be still relying on the, the donors from the US and, and Japan. And that also come with some conditionality on Mongolian democracy. So you will see the Chinese market coming up. And at the same time, you still like a seat that Mongolia is still like kind of like a kind of force that came under the, the donor conditionality on the foreign aid. So the, I mean, that's kind of interesting, right? Because of course, China is undergoing a very parallel development. Let's leave Russia uh, aside for a moment as an economic engine, because perhaps China is a bit more relevant to Mongolia, at least for this period. And so if Chinese growth had unfolded the way it did, the, 20, the, the 2000s were a period of high growth, obviously, it does seem likely that a coal boom would have resulted in Mongolia, right? Because uh, for the 2000s, at least, until climate change concerns and greenhouse gas emission concerns put a damper on coal, uh, until then, coal would have been in high demand in China and, and Mongolia would have supplied that. But the coal industry would have looked very different uh, from the way that, that Oyotoga has unfolded, right? I, I would say in the coal industry, we would have seen a greater number of medium-sized Mongolian companies in coal mm -hmm. tied to specific political factions. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I do think that that would have had an impact on, on politics, don't you? Certainly, I agree on that. So that will, that will definitely come into that. But 
at the same time, when uh, the small nation is under the constraint, and they would probably see that that structural constraint will force the Mongolian leaders at least like, uh, let the talent flow go first. So mm -hmm. it will be probably uh, we will probably expect like a better consensus and compromise on the talent flow than the other projects. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't like, expect like I say, but if if there were not any flooding in Australia, would Mongolia be a strong uh, supplier of the coal to to China? We still we still don't know, right? That's a, another interesting question. If so, that's okay. I'll stop. <laughs> Yeah, so the so yeah, Tavan Tolgoy would have developed earlier, but if I'm right that under this hypothetical setup, we would have seen a, a greater number of medium sized Mongolian companies in a coal boom, don't you think that we would have seen um more rent seeking behavior in politics and and more attempts at um, influence peddling and at buying influence and more corruption from this more varied coal industry than we would have seen from that one partly foreign owned project uh, that supplies so much of the budget. Yeah, I, I will agree on that on uh, two reasons because okay. The one of the reasons OT came is like a, OT really brought up Mongolia at the global arena. Like a, up to like a 1990 or 2000, the West or the, the European Union, they didn't really interest in Mongolia. And that gives them very low visibility of Mongolia and Mongolian democracy. So whatever the contest or opposition or public demand happened in Mongolia in protest of the corrupt government or, or the, the bad deals, it like an international community will really remain silent on this because there's nobody knows what's happening in Mongolia. So I would I would probably agree with you on that okay we will still we will still see that strong competitions over the over the commodity business and that will continue to corrupt the government and the government will not no longer like providing the promises to the public so Mongolia will be kind of like in a vicious cycle of the four year elections. But uh, probably we will see the institutions are not performing well, and we will see nobody really even, like uh, no external leverages on Mongolia from the Western democracies, especially on the on the democratic development or institutions. I would probably see that the okay, EU is not coming to Mongolia, Germany probably not interested in Mongolia, and Mongolia probably wouldn't be a member of the OC, OSCE. And the Japan and, and US will be pulling out their aid because of their own economic situations. And Mongolia really needs to rely on its southern neighbor. And that either like put the pressure on the political elites to join and make a compromise, please both China and, and the domestic public public. So very interesting. I agree on that. Yeah, so the uh, I like the way you you talked about this in terms of what it would have done to foreign relations, and I think you're quite right there that that really would have changed the scenario quite a bit around. But just to wrap up, then um, I mean, obviously this is a very academic discussion because, of course, Oyutoger was discovered, um, and of course it has been uh, now uh, operational for some years. Underground construction is set to start in May for an expanded. Uh, set of activities to then actually go into bigger production in the early 2020s. Uh, just to wrap it up, though, real quick, Mandy, what um, I mean, can we say? What's our sense of what the state of Mongolian democracy in 2016 is, right? Because we're coming up to a parliamentary election in June. Uh, so, just a quick summary compared to 2002, what does democracy look like in 2016? With OT or without OT? Without OT in the current, the real world. It's a, I don't think a Mongolia is a great place. You keep your expectation at zero. You could go either either minus or plus. So I would say that this, this is a small state and small part. It's a small state of the big politics. So, but there's a always Mongolia always has a room to maneuver and room to change. And we often go to the extremes. Like in in 2008, we had that 
writing in July after the parliamentary elections and all the parties come over and they fix it, try to fix the problem. And so I wouldn't give like a high expectations of progress, but I wouldn't really say it's uh, regressing back. But I will see Mongolia is kind of always stays at a zero point and anybody could look Mongolia into either way. Okay, so very good. I would, uh, I mean, my from my perspective, I would say, well, uh, if we if we step back a little bit, um, mm -hmm. it's useful to note that Mongolia continues to be the only state socialist, post-state socialist democracy in Asia. Uh, and so when we look from outside of Mongolia, I think we have a greater appreciation than we're, when we're looking at domestic debates, where oftentimes, and this very much includes me, we, we're concerned about directions that political parties are taking or, or news about the election law and those sort of things. But in principle, it's always worth noting that, that Mongolian democracy is on relative solid footing. Uh, and that has and celebrated 25 years of its existence last year, and I I don't see any particular reason to expect that it's not going to continue to be democratic for the next 25 years. So, Mandy, thanks so much uh, for the discussion. Um, I'll just say real quick uh, to remind people that if they're interested in these topics, uh, you can read Mandy and I both write for the Mongolia Focus blog. Uh, you can find us at blogs.ubc.ca/mongolia, and if you're interested in my views. Um, Follow me at, uh, at Jay Dirkus as well. Mandy, you want to say where people can read up on your work? I think it's the same uh, blog post. Like we're just trying to write a blog post in Mongolia, and we really love to hear any critical, great constructive criticism on this subject because we're kind of absorbing it. Maybe like we're at the same time reflecting it wrong or explaining it in different ways. So just looking for very constructive engagements from the readers. That's true. So thanks, Mandy. Uh, and we'll have, uh, hopefully, we'll have more Mongolia labs in the future. Thank you so much. We'll do. All right. Thank you very much, Julian.